All right, we are ready to begin. Let's get started. Uh, let me introduce our today's guest. Uh, before that, myself. This is Ramanuj from Law Sico, and uh, we are live on right now on YouTube, Facebook, as well as LinkedIn Live. And we are having with us today Julian Julian Lonbe, and he is essentially. Uh, he's a very senior professor of law at the Birmingham uh, Law School, Birmingham University Law School, and he has done many amazing things in his long career, and including uh, you know, he has been advisor to many intergovernment organizations and associations of lawyers, and we are very lucky to have him today with us, and he's going to talk about free movement of legal services, which has been something that uh, existed in, uh, in the European Union, not so much with respect to India. India doesn't have any free uh, movement of legal services out of outside our international boundaries with other countries. But it's a very definitely an important and interesting subject to discuss. And we have a global expert, Julian Lonbe with us today. So Julian, welcome to Law Seco. And thank you for making time for us. Hello, everybody. Uh, I believe um, my colleague Ben Atkins is going to say a few words of introduction, and then I am coming in. So if he's allowed to unmute, that would be terrific. Uh, and I will share the slides. Sure, Ben is online. Yes. Hi, hopefully you can hear me. Hi, Ben. Yes. Brilliant. Go ahead, Ben. Okay, so um, I'll just briefly introduce myself. My name is Ben Atkins. Um, I'm the uh, admissions manager here at the Birmingham Law School. Um, so I was just going to give you a very brief overview, uh, an introduction to a little bit about Birmingham Law School and a little bit about our history as well, just to give a, a bit of background on that before I hand over uh, to Julian. Yeah, that's great, please. Um, so we, we do have some slides that I think Julian might be able to um, pop up in a moment. Yeah, uh, just allow to you to share screens. Are you going to share it now? The, the, I, the yeah, I'm going to share it now. Brilliant, thanks Julian. Uh, if, if not, Jules, I think I can do it quite easily now. Is that sharing now? Yes. Yep, perfect. So I think I've got mine sharing at the moment, Jules, so we're okay. Okay. Um, so just to introduce you to the University of Birmingham. Um, so we're, we're a very old university. We're founded in, in the 1900s. Um, and some of you may have heard of the term red brick university, which is uh, the term that we use for our, our type of university. Um, and it just means that we were the first civic university. So we, we were built to, to support the city of Birmingham uh, and support the local area and develop the, the economy and the educational standards uh, of the area. Um, we're, we're a very well-established university. Um, we've had over 10 Nobel Prize winners uh, coming from the university itself uh, and also had many firsts, including the first medical school in the UK and the first faculty of commerce as well. So here's just an overview of what our campus looks like. Um, myself and Julian are usually based right in the center, uh, right by the clock tower that you can see there. Um, the law building is right next to there, so, so right in the very center, but it's a, it's a fantastic campus to, to be working on, uh, usually, but at the moment we're both working remotely. So a little bit about um, the university itself. It's a, a, a university of an excellent reputation, uh, a top 100 university in the world, uh, 87th in the world in the last QS international rankings. Um, again, a very big university, over 33,000 students study with us um, and a huge international population um, included in that, so around, around 7,000 students. Um, we're also a founding member of, of the Russell Group, um, which is the elite research-led universities in the UK. Um, and that's why the topic that Julian will be speaking about shortly is, is, is so useful and, and so relevant right now. And finally, just a little bit, uh, just before I hand over to Julian, just around our current relationship with, with India. Um, so the university itself has, has developed an India Institute, 
um, which brings our research and partnership and, and economic and interest together uh, and much closer together than they have been. Um, so it's, it's a really a great opportunity for us to develop these links and we're, we're really pleased to be able to speak to you today. We have a very large Indian community both in the university and in the city of Birmingham. Uh, so it's, it's a great opportunity to, to find out a bit more about, about how, how we can work together. Um, and something you, you're, you're probably aware of is that the university itself is uh, an approved provider of, of education by the Bar Council of India as well. Um, so I'll, I'll give a bit more information at the end of the talk just around what kind of options there are if you are interested in that. Um, but it's worth knowing. Um, and I think a key thing to share is just that over the last uh, five years, the, the partnerships between the university and, and India have grown by around about 50%. And we're, we're really excited by that and looking forward to, to continue that as we move forward uh, going on. So I'm going to stop sharing now and then I'm going to hand back over uh, to Jules, if that's OK. So let me just end that there. So over to you, Julian. Hopefully you can share your screen now. Can you see my screen? No, we can't share. Maybe Ben, you can stop sharing your screen and then Julian will be able to share. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, we can see Julian's screen. All right. So you can't see much on it quite now. So in a moment, my first slide should come up, hopefully. Can you see my slide? Yes, legal services. You can see. Okay, excellent. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> legal services is my topic. Uh, in the UK, the term lawyer is not a legally protected term, and it's somewhat ambiguous term. Um, what happens in the UK, in effect, is that we have very limited areas protected for lawyers. By that I mean anybody, for example, can give legal advice in the United Kingdom. It's not a reserved activity. Uh, this means we have a very competitive market-driven uh, legal service industry. Uh, they're made complex because we have three legal systems in the UK. We have a Scottish one, a Northern Irish one, and one for England and Wales. But to reduce um, the complexity, I'm just going to have a look, quick look at England and Wales. You'll see, oh my God, it doesn't look very reduced to me. Maybe your thoughts on looking at this slide. But there's multiple regulators. Um, each of these red ones here are a regulator. So we've got eight or nine regulatory agencies, autonomous, that are regulating particular sectors of the market. The ones most familiar will be the solicitors and the barristers. Uh, and for competitive reasons, we have separated out representation, that's the law society, from regulation. Because there was a view that when they were joined functions, there was a tendency to feather the nest, as it were. Why would they regulate in a way that they gave themselves any harm or stopped them maximizing their profits? So those functions are separated. And we now have also uh, a novel, or well, relatively novel thing here, the ABS, it's the um, Alternative Business Structure. And this allows non-law firms businesses, individuals to run lawyers. So Smith's The Bookshop can have legal services. Um, and there's a lorry transport company that runs legal services and so on. Uh, it's not completely unregulated. They have to be approved uh, and they have to have certain um, officers on the board, um, but they don't need to be lawyers. So in the UK, it's very liberal. Uh, relatively. Uh, it is still regulated, but in a much more liberal way than in many jurisdictions. So moving along to looking at what happens in Europe um, and how can we free up legal services across the 32 countries involved. The countries are covered, 28 of them, well, 27 by EU law, 28. UK is on the verge of leaving the EU, European Union. 
We have the European Economic Area countries, that's uh, Norway and Iceland uh, and Liechtenstein, and we have the Swiss also who have joined in by separate treaties, but altogether it's 32 countries. Now each of those countries have their own legal traditions, their own legal histories, their own legal systems. Uh, they're strongly linked to their emergence as countries, and they're very proud of their constitutions and their legal traditions. Uh, they are being modernized somewhat slowly and sporadically by the integration that's happening in Europe between the different member states of the European Union. To give you a rough idea of the density of lawyers across Europe, we have Liechtenstein has the largest number of lawyers. Liechtenstein is absolutely tiny little principality uh, stuck right next to Switzerland. Uh, but they have a lot of tax work, they have tax secrecy and so on, and they have a lot of lawyers to hide people's money. I'm being a little bit mean. I hope this isn't being broadcast too widely. I shouldn't be rude about countries. The next most populous uh, lawyer countries are Spain and Italy and Greece. And they have over three lawyers per thousand. Uh, in their population and it's largely because when Spain and Italy they have um, very open access to university law degrees. Uh, the UK is pretty high up there, 2.27 lawyers per thousand. Uh, and we go down Sweden and Finland. These are representing the Scandinavian countries where traditionally they don't regulate, they regulate even less than the UK does. So you don't need to be a lawyer. So hence they don't need a lot of lawyers and a lot of law graduates graduates from universities can go straight into advising and dealing uh, with clients. Uh, I put America in there as a comparator, it's famously uh, lots of lawyers, 3.82. And I put in India, I found some statistics, uh, slightly old. Of course you have over a million lawyers, but it's only 1.12 per thousand, even though you have a very large number of actual lawyers. So we, we got large numbers of lawyers, well over a million practicing lawyers in Europe. Um, they have their different national legal orders, as I've mentioned. Um, famously, we have the distinction between the civil law, the Napoleonic or Germanic codes, and the English common law, which India is, of course, very familiar with, where the judges play an important role in developing uh, the legal rules. So, uh, given they have lots of national law that's different, given that the lawyers servicing these legal systems are different. Um, the scope of reserved activities varies. The UK is liberal. As I've mentioned, the Scandinavian countries are even more liberal. And then we have some very strict countries uh, where, for example, in Germany, the legal advice must only be given by designated persons. Normally, that's a Rechtsanwalt. Uh, again, if we look at France or Portugal, um, similar rules but large chunks of work are done by notaries. So all the land transactions, property transactions, corporate creation of companies and so on, is not done by what we would call lawyers, but by the notary. Now, so different types of lawyer exist, um, but in the terms of the advocate who goes to court, their roles are generally quite different across the European states. As you know, in England, we have barristers and solicitors separate. So there are lots of varieties of lawyer. Uh, some countries have more than one, like the UK. Uh, different activities, uh, different legal training systems to cope with that. So the structure of training is different, although it's gradually being harmonized across Europe. Uh, the duration varies. So the UK, uh, you can be a lawyer very quickly, relatively speaking. Uh, in Austria, you have to do a four-year law degree and then a five-year training and exams. So that's at least nine, possibly 10 years of training, whereas the UK is much shorter. Uh, and this is the other big difference here, substance. Obviously, in France, you're mostly learning French law, French legal system, French evidence, French everything, uh, and the same for all the other countries. So given the different types of lawyers, given the different legal systems and how they work, how on earth uh, can we hope to 
harmonize in any way at all. Um, in addition to those structural things, law is delivered in different ways. So we have in the UK what I would call mega lawyering. Uh, and it varies. I mean, in the UK, we have law firms with several thousand lawyers uh, in one firm. Uh, but we still also have some sole practitioners. Uh, the reserved activities vary. The monopoly of activities varies. So France, Luxembourg have absolute monopolies on advice. Uh, in the UK, we have monopolies of our professional titles. So the term barrister is protected, the term solicitor is protected. If you use those terms, uh, the law will come after you. Uh, and then we have the market force approach or the consumer protection approach. That is the Scandinavian approach. Uh, these rules, national rules, are reinforced by civil and criminal penalties. As I've mentioned, if you use the term solicitor when you're not one, uh, things will happen. Similarly in Germany or Spain, if you're giving legal advice and you're not authorized to, the law will come down on you. So that set of facts and legal variety implicates that you can't possibly have a British lawyer practicing in another jurisdiction or vice versa without civil and criminal penalties being imposed. So how on earth does it work? Well, the first thing to say uh, is that European Union law has a big major role in getting rid of these barriers and that operates under three main principles. The first principle they established, this is the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg, was primacy of this new type of law, EU law. In other words, they ruled that if there's a conflict between national law, including any constitutional provision, uh, whatever its nature or, or duration or temporal activity, uh, European law will trump it and beat it. So that was the first principle they established. The second principle was what they call direct effect. Uh, and this simply means that union law doesn't just trump national law, it also is capable of giving individuals rights and companies, of course, rights which they can have enforced in domestic or national courts. So if you have a European Union right, uh, it will prevail over any national law and will also be uh, available to be used in national courts. And the third principle is that the remedies for any breach of Union law must be effective. This means that any national remedy that's available can be put to use to enforce European Union rights. Uh, and in fact, they can um, be very excessive. So for example, um, there's a principle of equal treatment between men and women in union law. And we used to have in the UK that women retired earlier at 60 and men retired at 65. Uh, this is no longer the case, but in the olden days, that was the case. So some women who were forced to retire at 60 didn't want to, said, hey, this is unfair. Union law should protect me and give me equal treatment. And they won their case. And the remedy in English law was um, a compensation of about £6,000, roughly. But the English court awarded the woman, as Mrs. Marshall, awarded her 18,000 pounds, in other words, three times the maximum set by English law. And they did it because they said union law requires an effective remedy and a remedy that will dissuade others from breaching it. And therefore we're not bound by English law. Union law has primacy, has direct effect, and we're gonna give you an effective remedy. So that's just an example. So now turning to how that very powerful mechanism is used to liberate legal services, TFEU is the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. It's the current main treaty. And it provides for a right of establishment and a right to provide services in Articles 49 and 56. And workers are also free to move under Article 45. So this is a general free movement provision. That means companies should be able to move to another country if they want to 
make their cars in Poland where labor is cheaper, they can do so. Uh, the lawyers can go there and set up in principle and they can provide services over that. The initial interpretation of uh, these articles was that equal treatment would apply. In other words, if I went to France, uh, I would be treated as the French would be treated. In the old maxim we use in England, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Well, this, of course, is problematic for lawyers, uh, because if I go to France as a British lawyer, an English lawyer, they will say, yes, of course, you can give legal services. The treaty allows it, but on terms of equal treatment. So please, first, before you see your client, Dr. Lombe, uh, go and get a French law degree. It only takes a few years. Uh, pass the French bar exam, pass the stage and all the other components. In other words, I would have to wait eight years before seeing my client because equal treatment, okay, where you're in France, you jolly well do what the French must do first. Now that approach um, was not a, an approach that the UK favored and we there was quite a lot of litigation about it, there were squabbles about it. And the court gradually moved to a new approach, which it is now uh, fully in swing, and that is a market access approach. So it wasn't equal treatment anymore. If you arrived in your host country from one another one and you found you were impeded in delivering your service or establishing or working, you could say, what is the justification for you limiting my rights here? I, the lawyers would say, I'm not a French lawyer. I'm not an avocat. That's the French style, they're lawyers. I don't want to be an avocat. I'm an English solicitor. I want to help my old lady client who's living in the Charles V, uh, no, George V Hotel in Paris. I want to help her make her will. I'm not intruding on French law at all. Uh, and then, of course, um, that would be permitted under the new system. Let me give you a case example. The Cakes a case, a Spanish bank, Cakes uh, uh, tried to establish in France a series of banks. Well, it didn't have any French clients. It didn't have any French deposits. Uh, and so it decided, well, I got to get market share and bring in the money so I can start my lending. And so they started giving interests on the current account. Well, under French law, that was prohibited. French banks were not allowed to give interest on current accounts. The Spanish bank did so. And when the French authorities attacked them for it, prosecuted them, their defense was, this rule in France is inhibiting my right to establish. I can't be an effective bank unless I get in clients with their money. And you haven't given me any justification why banks shouldn't give interest. And the European Court of Justice uh, ruled when the French courts asked it to, that's correct. France has not justified this restrictive rule and therefore cannot impose it on uh, the Spanish bank. So with that background about the treaty articles, the secondary law started to develop and the union has the right to create secondary laws, a whole complex legal decision-making procedure. Uh, and one of the instruments of law is a directive and it fleshes out the broad rights. And the directive on lawyers is uh, number 77249. And this allows any fully qualified lawyer and then it lists the types of lawyers that are covered and it includes the English barrister and English solicitor without any prior registration requirement to practice in another European economic area state so any of the 32 countries on a temporary basis so that means now when I go to France using this directive I can say I'm only here to see my old lady to make her will and um, I have a right to do so under this directive. There are only a few narrow exceptions um, and these relate to court appearances. Because the procedures in courts are different in each country, as you know in England they have to wear wigs and do this, that and the other. Uh, in France they don't do cross-examining because that is the judge's role and so on. So there are quite significant differences in court procedures uh, so when you go to court or appear before an administrative authority, the host state can say you should have a local lawyer with you to tell you to put your wig on, to tell you how to do it and so on. And the other reserved area uh, is in property transactions. 
And that's because across the continent of Europe, without the UK that is, most of the countries uh, have a notarial system for property transactions. So lawyers don't do it at all, don't know how to do it. Uh, and of course, in England, this is reserved uh, for solicitors or special licensed conveyances. So there are limits for that. But there are no limits on the legal advice you can give. So an English lawyer could give advice on French law. Uh, of course, he would be breaching his uh, professional rules if he gave advice on French law when he didn't understand it at all. Uh, because obviously you have to be competent before you can give advice. Uh, but there's no legal restriction on it, apart from using your common sense. The second directive is the establishment directive. Uh, and this allows permanent establishment by lawyers, not just a temporary fly in, fly out. Uh, so any uh, of the nominated professions uh, can move to another country this time they have to register and they can practice in that other country as a home state lawyer. So they stay being an English lawyer, uh, but they're working in Germany, for example. Um, now they can practice home law, that is their English law in that case, the host state law, so German law and EU law. Uh, now, if they do that for three years, uh, and there's a bit of case law about what regular and effective practice means. If they do that for three years, they can turn into a local lawyer. So if I go to Brussels and work in a Use law firm, thank you, whoever that is. <laughs> if I go into Brussels and um, work for three years, I can turn into a, a Belgian lawyer, an advocat or avocat, or a Rechtsanwalt fan in Germany and so on. So that means I've got two titles. I'm an English lister and a German Rechtsanwalt. So this is very extraordinary and unusual in uh, normal international relations that without any assessment of testing or anything else, you can uh, get the local title and practice as a local lawyer in another country. Of course, you're then subject to all that country's rules. You've got to pay your practice fees and all the rest of it. So this is a remarkable achievement. Uh, there is a third way you can move across the frontier, and that is by having your qualifications recognized. And this is another directive. It applies to all professions, not just lawyers. Uh, I've given on this slide an example of a German Rechtsanwalt in yellow on the left, wanting to be a French avocat. So obviously he could just move to France and practice for three years. That's easier said than done if you're a sole practitioner. Uh, but this gives him another way of doing it through uh, the magical mechanism of this directive, what he would do, the German lawyer would go to the French uh, competent authority. They use that neutral term because in some countries it's the court, in others it's the Ministry of Justice, in others it's the bar and so on. But whatever the competent authority is, you go there and you say, here I am, I'm a Rex Sandwald, here's my diploma. And the diploma is not meaning the university degree um, or the professional uh, certification. It is the whole works, everything you've done, all your qualifications. And what the host authority does then is compare that to the national requirements. So they'll look at the German, what the German lawyer knows, and they'll then say, here's what the French lawyer must know and be able to do. And if there are any missing bits that are substantially missing, which there always are more or less in uh, when you're moving across frontiers for lawyers, uh, then there can be a compensation. So we move up to here, and these are the compensation mechanisms. The host country can say, do an aptitude test, that is, pass an exam in the areas which you're missing. Or they could say, uh, you must take a traineeship or an adaptation period and learn the missing bit. Now, all the bars and law societies except Denmark have opted for the test. If you pass that test, if you need to, uh, then you are immediately joining the local profession and you can use their title. Uh, and the directive gives all sorts of procedural guarantees, which I won't go into at this point. So this is a very powerful mechanism. Uh, it means you don't need to wait three years. You just need to wait until you can pass the exam. 
uh, to get in. And the exam is less onerous uh, than the normal route in. I mean, if you came to England and wanted to pass all our exams, you'd have to do the law degree or, or a, another degree with a um, special one year diploma. You'd have to do, then do the professional training, takes one or two years and you have to pass exams and so on. This is one exam, there's nothing else. Uh, so it is quite a speedy, speedy way of getting through. So this is a summary slide uh, of how the lawyers can move across the frontiers. On the top line, we have the fully qualified European lawyer, uh, and he's got three methods of accessing legal practice in the host state. In this top line, he's staying as a British lawyer or a French lawyer, uh, but he can still nevertheless practice in another country. In the middle line, uh, we've got the different three routes. Uh, and here you access not just the state and the right to give services, but also the host profession. So you can become a Rex Anbart or a Greek Dikigoros. And in the last one here, this is a new route uh, recently developed and is not in the treaty and it's not uh, in uh, the directives. It's this Morgan Besser case. Um, a half qualified French lawyer. She had a law degree, but hadn't done any professional practice or bar exams, moved to Italy and wanted to join the Italian training. And the Italian said, you can't, you haven't got an Italian law degree. It's called a laurea in jurisprudenza. You don't have one, you can't come here, please. Uh, well, she went off to the Italian court who referred it up to the European court. And the European court said, you can't do that. You must assess her qualifications. What is she missing? If she's not missing anything, let her straight in to the training. If she's missing things, uh, then you can make her you know, complete, you know, make sure she does know the basics before she does the training. So it's not just qualified lawyers that can move. Okay, I'm not going to go through that one. Um, let me just finish with this slide. Uh, I've run through the rights, but I haven't run through the difficulties. Uh, the first thing is, who is regulating this cross-border lawyer? If he's an English lawyer in Paris, he's not in England anymore. Uh, how's he being regulated? Who is going to regulate him? Uh, which ethical rules are going to operate? Is he going to bring his English ethics with him, or must he comply with the French ethics? What if he's done the uh, mutual recognition of qualifications as is an English and a French lawyer? Which rules will he apply? What about legal privilege? The rules on legal privilege vary from country to country. They're quite different in some countries. They're contradictory sometimes. Uh, and which one will you apply? Will you apply the French one or the English one? What type of legal structure can your firm have? I've mentioned in England, we have the alternative business structures. Most of the continent is uh, looking in horror at this, that um, a non-lawyer can run a law firm uh, and they don't allow it in their countries. But can an English ABS move across? Or must they adopt the local structures? What about relationships with local lawyers? Can you employ them? Can you work for them? In some countries, a salaried employment is forbidden. What if I go to France and I um, make mistakes or I steal a client's money, uh, who is going to discipline me? I'm not in England anymore, I'm in France. So what procedures will apply? Who will apply them? And we have the modern problems. What of machine assisted lawyering? Uh, we have quite a lot of this started already uh, and we have the first inklings of non-human lawyering uh, occurring. Now some countries, France, has prohibited some uh, non-human lawyering. For example, they, um, in the UK and in America, and probably Australia, we have programs that predict uh, what judges you want on your case, or if you have certain judges, what would be the best arguments to use? And they assist the lawyer to work out uh, their litigation strategy. Now that was introduced into France and the French government uh, banned it and there's a prison sentence if you use it. Uh, but what if um, the French client goes to a lawyer in England and says, help me, help me, and of course they can use it there. 
Yeah. So we have, and, and this isn't all the problems we have, we have a lot of issues arising from this free movement. I, I can tell you that they're not a crisis. I mean, there haven't been major problems of any sort of discipline at so far. Um, there are a few uh, naughty lawyers who use or, or try to abuse the system. And I, I'll just give you one example. Uh, in the Teresi case, um, in Italy, which is on your screen here, my little dots on it, uh, they have a very strict bar exam and it's quite difficult to pass. Pass rate isn't that high. So what Italian uh, law graduates have done is they rushed across to Spain here yeah. and they've had their legal degree recognized as equivalent to the Spanish legal degree and there is an area in Spain where they don't look that closely at what you've actually done so if your Italian certificate says civil law tick they say oh in Spain we have civil law and they just tick it they don't take account of the fact civil law in Spain and Italy is quite different uh, so once you have your Spanish diploma your law degree uh, in Spain, until very recently, you could automatically become a lawyer with no further training or assessment. And so loads of Italian lawyers, thousands of them, went using this route. And then they came back to Italy and said, here I am, I'm a Spanish lawyer, uh, you must let me practice law. And of course, using the European directive as a Spanish lawyer, they can give advice on Italian law. And they evade, therefore, four or five years of training and a difficult exam. Now that is tricky. And there are various other cases from Austria and other uh, other jurisdictions. But that just gives you an example of one of the sort of problems. Now, I think I've certainly used up my time, so I'm going to close. There. And, and of course, any questions are very welcome. Uh, I'll, so I'll stop sharing my thing. So, uh, thanks, Julian. That was quite insightful. Uh, you want me to help you to stop sharing this? Uh, yeah, please. I'm having trouble pressing the button. All right. There we go. It's well done. Sorry, that was a bit of a blast, I know, but I tried to give an overview. No, no, that was great, actually. It, it was very insightful. So we frequently get these questions from Indian lawyers, and they say that, you know, if I want to go and work in Europe, what could be a possible way? And and that way, obviously, I mean, I, I wasn't ex exactly expecting this area of discussion, but also there's a, there are two, one question of Indian lawyers is that, how can I go and work in Europe, in England or Wales or Scotland or any other European country, maybe France? Uh, there are other people who are, there has been, you know, questions and we had some uh, uh, cases filed here even in that the Supreme Court over whether uh, law firms from Europe can practice here or even from US practice here in India. So when, when the, the idea of, uh, you know, legal work crossing border comes to mind, it seems like can international law firms work in India and India so far has taken the position that no, they cannot except for fly in fly out basis, handling arbitrations, they cannot uh, you know, provide services. But at the same time, a lot of the international law firms in London, Japan, uh, USA have India desks or India practice groups, which provide India specific services. So of course not sitting, they are not pr present in India. They are providing these services from other places. And somehow it looks like that as people get more and more used to remote work, this artificial you know, uh, difference of uh, people having to work from a certain jurisdiction, I mean, it may reduce over time because people, and except for appearing in courts, there will be a lot of work which people can do from wherever they are without having to ever set their foot in a country. Uh, in a particular country or jurisdiction. So I know I have multiple questions. One question about what would be your advice to Indian lawyers who want to practice in Europe? Because many people want to do this. Many people want to have an international career. In fact, we had a session yesterday, Gordon Chung, who, uh, who came from Hong Kong and is practicing in London at Baker and McKinsey and qualified in New York Bar. And 
So today, the young lawyers want to have an international uh, presence and want to work in many jurisdictions. So what's your advice to them? Yeah, can't hear you once in a while. I'm mute. I'm just in mute. Yeah, thank you. On. Yeah, okay. So coming to England and Wales is not a problem. Um, India is a recognized jurisdiction and there are no limits. Well, the limits are migration limits. They're not legal limits for being a lawyer. Uh, so you don't need any exams or anything else. You can come across as an Indian lawyer and practice uh, as an Indian lawyer. Um, you can practice and give advice on English law because that is not restricted by our rules. Uh, if you make a complete mess of it, somebody may sue you on the basis of consumer law, but not on the basis of practices reserved. So we're very open in that respect. We took a decision quite a long time ago. I might say that in the 60s, 1960s, when the American lawyers started arriving in London in big numbers, we were very worried about it. And we made it very difficult for them. We didn't let them employ English lawyers. We had a rule that you couldn't be bigger than 26 partners and so on all these things got swept away we learned a lot from the competition and we've actually you know taken the leaf out of their books so the english law firms are very big and successful globally now uh, so it isn't a bad thing what happens is if you let in the foreign lawyer is that they employ your lawyers yeah you because know, they need the indian lawyers for their knowledge and so on and then those indian lawyers go off and start their own firms and they you know they learn a lot of the techniques and tricks and so on. So a lot of techno parser, not, I don't mean techno in the sense of uh, AI and so on, I mean techno in terms of methods of making contracts and that sort of thing. So for um, the UK is an open place with regards to legal services. Uh, and it's because we wanted London to be a center. We want our, our law courts have a lot of cases with nothing to do with England at all. Uh, the Russian billionaires, uh, and so on, are all suing each other in England. Um, so that is one reason um, that we're open. Uh, we found it has made our lawyers much more competitive, uh, much more innovative, uh, having the competition. Um, so we haven't, you know, after our initial worry and saying, keep out, you know, what are you all doing here? We embraced the idea. Um, but I think your second point was about the internet and uh, yeah uh, before that julian just wanted to ask a follow-up question on this what about the qlts there's a qlts exam that you came so what is the purpose for that which i said again qlts qualified lawyer transfer scheme that you have in, uh, in UK. oh the qlts yes well that that operates um if you wish to become an english lawyer so if you're an indian lawyer and you want to be a solicitor Mm -hmm. uh, and that you used to want to be a solicitor because only solicitors could be partners, right? So you get the profits. The law now, you don't have to be a solicitor to get the profits. You could have an alternative. But, but if you wanted to be a solicitor to have that title, uh, you don't have to go to an English law school and do all the bar exams. You just pass this one QLTS exam, Qualified Lawyer Transfer System exam. Uh, that's quite an innovative exam. I don't know if you know what it is but there's a multiple choice assessment mm -hmm. uh first if and if you pass that you have what is called an osce an objective structured clinical exam and this is borrowed actually from the medics when they're training their doctors they want to see how they react with patients and so on so we've converted that to a law scenario so the the person the examinee comes into the room there's a client who's an actor who's been trained uh, and suddenly the, he'll go crazy or say silly things. So you've got to get the information you need to give him the legal advice in the interview. So they're testing your client handling skills. Uh, you then got to identify the correct legal processes. What are you going to tell the partner about this case? What, who should you go to? What, what are the legal issues? Uh, and then there's a research element. Yeah? Okay, you found out he's worried about joining his wife. Uh, what's the immigration law? Go and you know, find out. Uh, so it's a very active exam. It's not like you're sitting in a room with thousands of people uh, just scribbling on a piece of paper. This is testing your abilities. Um, so, uh, and that actually is, is going to be the system for all people wanting to be a solicitor in England and Wales from 2021. They're having a new exam regime and this is more so or less... SQ. 
what they use, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. What about being a barrister? If somebody wants to argue in the courts in UK, then it would be a different system, right? Uh, yeah, that is slightly more controlled. Um, and you need rights of audience in the higher courts. In the lower courts, there's no problem because a litigant can represent himself or herself. Uh, but in the higher courts, it is restricted. Uh, if you're a solicitor, you can get higher rights of audience and practice in the highest courts. You have to do some training. Uh, to be a barrister, the, they're not quite so open as the solicitors, but there is an exam also. It's not the modern one I just described. It's a more traditional uh, method. Okay, that's very helpful. Uh, another question, many Indians uh, travel to UK to do their master's degrees and many of them hope to, after that, stay back and practice, but many of them fail and you have been a uh, you must have had, you, know, you must have uh, seen some of those students who want to stay back in the UK and work, but they don't manage to. So what, where is the gap, given that you have such an open system? Of course, it's also subject to demand and supply. So if you can throw some light on that, that you know, where, where, what should people do differently to actually make a career in the UK if they do an LL in, in the UK? Okay. So you're not talking about immigration controls, which would be one of the difficulties they would have of assuming they have the appropriate visa and so on um well there's a big indian diaspora in in britain you know so that would be one place to get help uh and clients and so on if you're talking about being a lawyer i mean some of the indian entrepreneurs have taken over the biggest companies in the uk and they're very successful indeed uh more successful their children generally are more successful than white children in terms of getting good qualifications and so on so there's absolutely no barrier in that sense um i guess uh well we're in a new situation right now but when the economy is going ahead full steam if you have good qualifications and are adaptable i should think you would be in demand yeah and in particular maybe if you can link back to your Indian roots in the sense of helping us export things or import things, you know, make up connections with the subconscious, uh, that would be helpful too. Uh, but I guess my feeling is that most migrants are really motivated to succeed and really try hard. Um, there are some Indian law firms in London. Uh, India also has a very successful stay-at-home industry where they do a lot of the discovery and the you know the checking of documents and so on so there's quite um quite a lot of work legal work going back and forth right. uh, the sort of work you don't really want to leave india and the indian lawyers might want to keep uh what happens is um it tends to get exported to london and elsewhere you know because they're not allowed to be in india doing it if they were in india doing it you you wouldn't lose any more, but you would gain the knowledge, you know, because you'd have your Indian people in there. Of course, the London firms are employing Indian lawyers yes. you know, in London. Yes. Uh, so they have the expertise they need for these transactions. I mean, that's the whole point of a big firm is you have a one-stop shop. Yes. Um, none of these very big firms have become ABSs. And the, and the reason is they have sufficient capital. One of the reasons to be an ABS is you get in the equity partners, you know, with, with lots of money, so you can invest in your new stuff, staff and so on. They don't need that particularly. And they're worried that if they do it, uh, regulators uh, in other countries where they have offices will suddenly say, hey, you can't practice here anymore because you're not a law firm. So they've been very cautious and they don't particularly need to do it. So what would you say about the alternative, uh, like, you know, law, other structure apart from law firms, now you have startups and innovative internet models for legal services? Well, there are now thousands of them. Uh, and it is not, let me put it this way. If you're leaving a university in Britain with a law degree, you now have a choice of where to work because you can work for Smith the bookshop as a lawyer, you know? Uh, you can, so you've got a much greater choice for one thing. Second, um, they, they are regulated. They have to have a chief officer for legal practice and a chief officer for financial affairs who monitor and check that uh, 
rules are not being breached vis-a-vis -vis legal privilege and so on. Um, so they've been quite successful. Some have failed and not, not worked, um, but they are a source of innovation, a source of employment, and they're devising always new methods. I, I'm sure you've heard Richard Suskin perhaps on yes, his deconstructing right. law, uh, but that's what some of them have done. They've broken it into the components you need to, so for example, if I've, um, I don't know, I've got a parking fine or something, I can now go to a, a bot that does that for me. There's a chat bot created by a young British student who's now been snatched up by Silicon Valley, but he started in the UK, it's called Do Not Pay. And I entered yes. the data there when my parking ticket was and so on, or uh, you know, um, my train was late or something. Any, any of these minor disputes uh, can be now automated because you, he breaks it down. You know, did you park? Was there a yellow line? And you go right through every uh, fact you need to come up with a solution. You don't need to be a lawyer to do that. He well, he's not a lawyer, this fellow. He yeah, sure. was a young student, had to pay fines, and he worked out how to do it. And then he's now got lawyers working with him. But, so you can deconstruct a lot of law, even in a divorce. You know, there are certain grounds for divorce. Do you meet them? So you've got to match them all up. I mean, lawyers do more than that because they give the counsel and so on. Uh, but there's nothing to stop a lawyer using that system. Uh, and indeed, in the UK, they can be open to the public. So that's the type of development. Um, and AI is coming on stream now uh, for legal services. And, and uh, we're starting to, we've got some European rules now about um, the ethics of that. Uh, and they're trying to control what might happen because there have been some big databases, notably in America, uh, which are frankly discriminatory. You know, they end up uh, giving the wrong answer because the data they're based on is discriminatory. So if a lawyer doesn't understand how it works, they could be liable if they use such a thing. You know, um, they can't just say, well, the machine decided. The, you know, ultimate decision making by machines, the machines will be deciding without human input. Uh, and then it will be a non-lawyer owning this machine who is uh, raking in the money from clients and maybe giving bad advice because the machine isn't correctly programmed in some way. They'll be liable under ordinary law. But in the UK, that's permitted, you see. And, and that sort of firm could employ lawyers to help make sure the law is correctly applied within their machine system or tech system. So there are lots of uh, tech hub solutions coming up. Um, and lawyers are using them, um, but I've already mentioned the, the several for working out what the best line of argument is and going through the precedents. I mean, we've all used Lexis, Nexus, and uh, you know similar programs for doing our legal research. I mean, that's just computer-assisted research, isn't it? Essentially, in the old days, you'd have to go to the library, wouldn't you? Pull out the book and open it up, and yeah. after it. so it's just a, an update. Um, so the ABS is, uh, I think there are over 12,000 of them now. They can choose who to be regulated by. In that list I, I had of all the regulators, the eight or nine regulators, yeah. mm -hmm. most of them can regulate ABSs. They've been licensed to do so by the Legal Service Board. So I could choose uh, any of them. To, you know, I can say which is the best regulator for me, which is least onerous or best suited. So it gives me a massive amount of choice. Uh, it might be a little bit confusing for the consumer, you know, because there'll be different rules. You know, they've all been approved by the super regulator, the legal service board, but they're different uh, for each, it depends which regulator you've chosen. So I think even the council for licensed conveyances, and they're the ones who aren't lawyers as such, they just convey property. It's when the, this is Thatcher, the government broke the monopoly of lawyers on conveyancing because they were charging lots of money for convincing and spending a long time doing it. So she said, right, you need a bit of competition. We'll allow this other group also to do it. Uh, but they can, I think they're authorized. Um, interestingly, the, uh, the accountant's body is also an authorized legal service provider. They've been longing for ages to enter the legal market. Uh, well, they have entered it in the UK and elsewhere. Um, and now they're an authorized provide under the legal service board. Um, what they really want now is legal pri privilege, which they don't have, um, but they can authorize legal services. 
So it's a very dynamic situation. Um, there's been a report published about 10 days ago by a prominent uh, academic saying that the regulation is so complicated now with all these different bodies, there should be one regulator. And it, um, the government has said, we're doing COVID, go away. <laughs> Um, and so is everybody else. It's not a good time to start changing it. They only changed, it only changed in 2007, and the ABS has started in 2012. You know, it took a while to set up the regulatory scheme, and nobody has much appetite for changing it all again. Um, I mean, eventually it will. It is a bit top heavy. And the, right. who pays for it all? It's the lawyers, of course, or the, the ones being regulated have to pay. Right. Um, so I wanted to ask a few more questions about practice in, in Europe, but I think I've run out of time. So if you may be having a five minutes more, I'll just ask if anybody has any questions. Um, Julian, could you hear me? Uh, I was saying that we have run out of time. It's eight almost. So if you if you have a little more time, we'll maybe take another five, ten minutes and take a few questions. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Okay, great. So, uh, anybody has any questions, please post them in the chat. I will quickly check on YouTube and everywhere else also if there are questions. Uh, any questions, please uh, post them quickly so that we can take them. In the meantime, I will just ask another question. If, if, uh, if an Indian lawyer wants to practice in uh, Europe, apart from in the UK, what are his other options? Okay, so the, the free movement I've described uh, in my talk just now applies only if you are a union lawyer and a union citizen. That means you've got to be a national of one of the member states. So if you're Indian or American or, or anything else, you don't have these free movement rights. So there you fall back on GATS and the uh, GATS obligations. Now, some of the countries in Europe have got specific um, commitments in GATS on legal services, which are quite generous. Uh, not as generous as the UK by any means, uh, but you can in some countries um, become a foreign, what is equivalent to a foreign legal consultant. Um, Germany, for example, you can, but you'd have, what you have to look at is the national law then, because European Union law uh, is limited in scope. I know I said it's quite powerful, it is, but only within its confines. So. Uh, who is a lawyer and how they train is up to each country. Yeah? What are the requirements? So in England, famously, as you know, to be a barrister, you have to eat dinner together you know, quite a few times in London. Uh, this is a bit eccentric and so on, but it's socializing, it's getting to know the senior judges and so on. There are other functions of it. Um, now, we require that. You know, that's one of the British things. So the EU can't say that's ridiculous. You're not allowed to do that. Yeah. Um, Germany has some very difficult exams uh, and a long state-run process for being a lawyer. Uh, in some states, it's, it's a whole series of eight-hour-long exams you have to pass. I mean, it's really difficult. Uh, most German lawyers have to spend a year training with a special private tutor to pass these very difficult exams. So each country will have its own rules about accessing the profession. Uh, and they, so really, you have to research, do your research for each country. Uh, there are various websites that are very helpful for doing that. Um, but essentially, that's what you'd have to do. Plus, of course, if you're going to one of these jurisdictions, you will need the language. You know, Because if they're going to make an exam for you, it's going to be in German or Italian or whatever their national language is. So if it, you know, it's no good going to say, I want to do it in English. You know, that would only work in Ireland <laughs> um, or, or Britain. Um, so, yeah. And Britain is facing this now. If we leave the EU without a deal, we will be on GATS terms with these member states. So I have actually written a short article about it. Um, but in some countries, we wouldn't be allowed to have an office. Uh, we would lose uh, rights to go to the European Court. Um, we'd lose our professional privilege in, in European proceedings. I mean, there are all sorts of pretty bad situations. We also um, the recognition and enforcement of judgments becomes an issue. Yeah, at the moment, we can rec get them recognized and enforced all across Europe. Um, but when we pull out, we're going to have to resurrect the Nagano Convention and some of the older treaties. 
because union law had replaced it all with more, it's rather like European arrest warrant, it's much quicker than extradition. Uh, but when we leave, unless it's in, an, in our agreement, which we don't know what's in it yet, it seems to be not being very well made so far, uh, we will be going back to extradition, you know, which means you can hardly spend years trying to get somebody back um, without success. Instead of the European arrest warrant, you give them the bit of paper, they're sent back straight away. So there are lots of, uh, you know, Britain wants to stay part of things like that. Um, in my view, as you can probably tell from the way I'm talking, I think we should never leave. We shouldn't have left. You know? uh, it's a backwards step, I think, for Britain to do that because yeah. we're yeah. being closer to our neighbours and, and it's effective. When we leave, if we don't have an agreement, you know, a lot of legal connections are going to be snapped up. I mean, for, for lawyers, it's, it's not just British lawyers, the German lawyers uh, very much like some of the British company incorporation setups. And they, a lot of German firms are using the British uh, legal forms. But when they leave, those will be illegal in Germany because you know, we won't be a member state. Yes. At the moment, you can choose where to set your company up so they can set up in England because we're a member state. Yeah. Uh, so there are lots of disjunctions going to happen. So it won't, perhaps it won't just be Indians being mystified. How do we do it? <laughs> yeah, it might be the British uh, also having trouble. Sure, sure. So I understand that a lot of universities in the UK have Dutch holding companies. So that would also be this kind of things would face challenges going forward. There's a question I have received from uh, this is from Asta. So she's asking me that you know could you ask a question about any kind of scholarships and what is happening post COVID at Birmingham University? Oh yes. Um, if you allow my colleague Ben to to um share his screen. I think he has a few slides on scholarships. Uh, so that's Ben Atkins, you need to activate. Yep. Yes. I can just quickly share my screen if that's okay with some, sure, some please go ahead. Yes. Okay, so I can just quickly share this. So we do certainly have, have opportunities. I've also just posted a quick link as well um, in the chat, which you should be able to see. Um, hopefully you can just see, see this slide though. So I won't go through all of them, but here's just a quick example of, of the programs we have on offer for postgraduate study at Birmingham. So we, we have our general LLM um, pathway, which then folds out into different pathways. So obviously, uh, Julian's uh, been talking through the international law and globalization related. Um, but we do have a, a range of different ones as well to kind of suit all kind of interests and backgrounds. Um, they happen on the picture of earlier. Um, we also have uh, an LLM in international commercial law based at our Dubai campus. Um, so I don't know if, if everybody's aware of that, but Birmingham recently uh, branched out into Dubai as well. Um, so that's a really great option, especially because um, there's a, a lot more scholarships available there as well. Um, so up to 50% scholarships on, on tuition fees are available to that, to that course at the moment. Um, we also have a, our first distance learning program as well for anybody interested in energy and environmental law. Um, so that's our, our first one that's launched this year. Um, it's a very exciting time uh, for the law school. Um, I won't dwell on the entry requirements. All that information can be found online. Um, but we, we're, we really uh, appreciate applications from all professional backgrounds um, that, that exist. So it's probably best to, to give me uh, an email uh, if you've got any queries about the actual entry requirements. But um, there's a little, a little idea of them there. Um, but obviously, the key one is around international scholarships. Um, this year, we've just given out our, um, our LLM scholarships, which is uh, four £10,000 fee waivers um, for international students and also a, a set of five £5,000 fee waivers for international students. Um, one of the recipients is, is an Indian student who's, who's joined us uh, last year, who's a, a fantastic applicant, and we're really looking forward to them joining us for their LLB programme. Um, and last year, we had uh, somebody for the LLM as well. Um, so it's, it's a really exciting time, but there is a lot of opportunities uh, at the moment for, for scholarships uh, for joining us. Um, and there's a little web link on the bottom there that you can go to um, to find out more. But also the link I've popped in the chat uh, has our direct link to the, to the law specific scholarships. Um, but there are also university wide ones uh, as well. Um, so that was kind of hopefully that answers that question that, yes, there are a lot of scholarships. 
Um, there, are specific, there are about 10 specific law ones as well, um, open to, to international students. So um, please do take a look at those and, and consider them as well. Great. Uh, one more question. Uh, how is COVID impacting the academic schedule or classes or campus presence? Well, that, uh, we, I spent much of the last uh, few weeks, uh, well, month and a half or so, worrying about this. Um, it is affecting us uh, severely in the UK at the moment. Um, lockdown, which we had, is slowly unlocking, but very slow. The universities are still shut, um, but the campus is starting to open. Um, but the law school is still bolted shut. Uh, we don't have any teaching right now. Uh, we're in the examining mode and, and grading. Uh, and we're hoping our, our terms in the UK start in the end of September, beginning of October. The best case scenario is we get a vaccine or everything is okay. Uh, we are planning though that it may not be all okay. Um, we don't know, of course. So we're thinking if we have social distancing measures still in place as they are now, lectures live lectures in a lecture theater will be impossible uh because we we simply don't have you know mega sized lecture theaters you know we, we've got one that seats 500 students normally uh but with covid distancing it only takes about 50. uh so you know if, that, if those measures their lectures will be online for the last few years, we've been recording lectures on video and, and audio anyway. Uh, so we are revising our curricula a bit. We are probably this summer going to put a lot more material online in case things are shut in terms of, of lectures. Uh, the lectures, I don't think will be just, the, some of them may be just the 50 minutes, you know, I'm talking to you. Uh, but I'm hoping we'll get a lot more interactivity in the lecture system using polling software and the like, uh, interactive MCTs, uh, probably lectures broken into bite-sized chunks and so on. Because having a diet of solid lectures for months on end without a professor there to talk to, normally we get interventions from the floor when we're lecturing, we're around after the class, students can't say what was this, what was that and so on. The seminars, that, that's a small group teaching. Uh, well, we, we're more hopeful we might be able to manage that, um, but it depends exactly on the situation. It may be we have to stagger it, you know? So every other seminar is in the classroom and the other ones are online. Uh, we have the software and everything, including Zoom, um, to do the online side but, of it. The other challenge will be for international students to travel uh, to, to, yeah. the, to the country. That's right. I think the well, charm the, of international education is that you get to travel to another country. So how yeah. do you that, that will be, that potentially is an issue. At the moment you can travel to the UK, well you can from some countries, I mean your country may prohibit it, but you'd have to quarantine uh, and at the moment we wouldn't be permitted uh, to run as we normally do, yeah, for fear of spreading the virus. Uh, so um, potentially if we go completely online, it would be feasible for an Indian student to stay in India uh, and get the full training, you know, the full course, because the lectures are likely to be online anyway. Um, if we do you know, sequential seminars being online, that would mean some students come in some are online so it would be possible for students based in outside the uk to follow a complete course um eric we're planning also you know we normally have quite a few traditional exams where you come into a big example and have to remember everything and you know work out the legal solutions and so on uh, but most of that we 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 may have that if we're allowed it some of it but we're also going to have alternative online assessments uh, which would mean that, in fact, you could, you know, follow the full course uh, online and complete it and successfully without stepping foot in Birmingham. I think that would be a pity if we have to do that, you know, because I think part of the 
joy of going somewhere else to train is you meet the people, you see what the country's like. Uh, you know, there's all these invisible factors and making friends is one of them. You know, it, imagine, you know, if we were online, we would have small breakout groups and so on, but, you know, it's different, isn't it? Not meeting someone, you have to be honest quite about that. It's not different. quite the same. So um, potentially it is possible that you'll be able to come if it isn't, then you'll be able to be online, perhaps, and follow one of our courses, or the, or the complete LLM, or even start your LLB. Right. And the, so if, if somebody is considering doing an LLM in UK, then it may be a good idea for them to postpone for a year or two, depending on the situation. Um, well, yeah, I, I mean, my loyalty to Birmingham says no, no, no. <laughs> but in reality, <laughs> I think... Yeah, if I was doing it and it wasn't desperate, I would say this isn't, you know, unless it all clears up miraculously. Of course, you know, of course. Then it's different. But if it's in, like it is now, you would not get the same experience, as you said, you know, of being here. I mean, yeah. Birmingham's terrific city. It's got the and biggest Indian population, I think, isn't it, out of any uh, British cities. Um, so, you know, there are also homely elements in a sense, you know, you'll see friendly faces and stuff. But... There is a last question I want to quickly ask before I go. I know it's only 15, 16 minutes past eight, but one last question I think is very, very interesting that being in India as a lawyer, is it possible to get some work outsourced from uh, lawyers or any other businesses in the UK? Uh, yes, it is. Um, there are some very big Indian outsourcing, legal outsourcing companies one of which is even established an office in London to facilitate. So the big law firms do use outsourcing. You know? uh, and India is a major destination. It must be said they also, you know, London is an expensive place uh, to have an office and staff. You have to pay them more, it costs more everything. So they also outsource to Northern Ireland and Birmingham even has big, the big law firms have offices there. It's cheaper for them. But India is way cheaper relatively to having it done in England. So, yes, there's a lot of outsourcing. Um, so, uh, Julian, this some of the what happens usually is that you know big, bigger law firms and big companies benefit from outsourcing, but not so much smaller lawyers and you know SMEs and because they don't have volume and they don't work with companies. But is it possible that there'll be freelance lawyers in India who might be able to assist? lawyers who are working individually or solo practice or smaller setups? Yeah, obviously the volume is an economic factor, but there are, um, yes, I mean, it's legally speaking, it's perfectly possible to do that. There's no barrier. There are data protection rules, um, actually the European GDPR, the data protection rules. So sending personal data outside the EU uh, unless there's an agreement with the host country, is difficult. Um, so there's that uh, issue, but there's no other impediment that I know of, um, except finding, you know, the matchmaker. Yeah, right. I need some help with it. And the, and the Indian firms that do it would probably be, I suppose they don't want competitors, but, it, you know, if you're thinking of doing it, maybe you should work for one of them for a bit and learn the ropes and then try and set up on your own. I mean, the big thing is how do you match up? Mm -hmm. uh, one place to start would be the Law Society of England and Wales. They have an Indian um, professional group of English lawyers who are interested in India and vice versa. And they're quite active. Uh, and they have an Indian desk officer in London who's from Delhi, who you know, helps the links because obviously they want the links. Uh, also, if you're interested in a particular region or area, I mean, the local law society, Birmingham has a law society. It has an international committee. Uh, two of the members of that are Indian uh, originally, I mean, not, you know, descent wise. Uh, and one of them has come to me and said, look, I would like to get better links with India. You know, and that's, he's, uh, I think he's been designated by his firm to get more links and get more clients in. Uh, so they're looking, you know, uh, we often have delegations from countries, we've had them from Japan, uh, Saudi Arabia and other places coming in, you know, this is a professional side rather than the uni side, and um, 
you know, seeking to make contacts. We're hoping to have a big jamboree uh, conference event around the Commonwealth Games in 2022. They're going to be in Birmingham. Uh, we're already planning with the local law society, you know, an event that will encourage Commonwealth lawyers to come. Uh, that will be well advertised in the UK side. Um, I think if you're going to do business, is you know, shaking someone's hand, sit well, I know COVID can we shake hands? Yeah, yes. The personal trust is very important and just seeing the person, their environment and so on is, is part of it. So that would be the sort of thing you'd need to do is make forays. You know, I think doing it just sitting in India and hoping people will get knock on your door is a bit optimistic. You're gonna to have to I mean, I suppose social media could help you make the contacts. But would somebody trust you? you know, there are lots of scams on the internet. You've got to build up that trust and reliability and make it clear exactly what the service is. But then I think um, coming to events, I mean, the, as I, the English and Welsh Law Society does it, but the regional ones also have events trying to encourage international contacts. Once we're leaving the union, which we are, you know, there'll be more need for us anyway to be extra friendly to everybody, you know, because we're cutting out, I don't know, about 50% of our trade is going to be decimated by leaving. So we're going to need to replace that. So there is a bigger, you know, next year that assuming COVID goes away, there will be a much bigger drive from the UK to make trading links of all sorts, including legal service links. Um, if you look at our law firms, the top 100 of them earn most of the money. Uh, but also, if you look at where their staff work, 46% only earn in England, 54% are out there in Singapore, in America, all over. You know? uh, they could be in India if India let them. Then you'd have a chance to get on the bandwagon. You know? um, but you know, I think, yeah, a sole practitioner or, you know, somebody wanting to start, it'd be difficult, I think, because of lack of recognition and so on, but they should be able to, uh, but I think they would have to come to some of this sort of event, uh, meet people um, and so on. We sometimes have events at the university as well. The India Institute encourages that. Uh, I've hosted lawyers from Turkey. I did a lot of work in Turkey a few years ago. Uh, and so we, we do get delegations from other jurisdictions coming in. Um, so, uh, and when we do, we tend to link up with the lawyers in town, you know, so they can meet people as well. Well, well I think uh, we are 22 minutes past eight, time to wrap up. Thank you so much, Julian, uh, for taking out and also Ben, both of you for sharing all the insights and knowledge and information. And it was really good. There's so much that I personally learned from this conversation. And I'm sure many people will watch this on YouTube. Over a period of time, I'm gonna tell many people who actually uh, you know, think about, you know, in India that they wanna have international career. I'm gonna share this with them. When they uh, see the topic, they probably wouldn't understand that it's about, uh, you know, this is this is what they're going to get out of it. They think it's about some theoretical thing. But I, I think, you know, once I tell them that this, the what we have discussed in this, they'll, they're going to find it very interesting. I really, uh, personally recommend the YouTube recording to a lot of people. And it was really great uh, talking to you. And there's a lot, new, lot of new things that I've learned today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for the opportunity. We, I've thoroughly enjoyed myself. Nothing like letting a professor let off steam and chat you know lucky i stopped when i did probably uh no it's great to talk to you uh, and i'm very pleased to meet you you know electronically hopefully one day we will be able to meet properly absolutely look forward to that and thank you everybody who logged in uh do keep in touch and uh and have a great night and have a great weekend okay thank you very much <laughs>